Hello and welcome back to DivideTheWord.blog. My name is Ralph Brickley and today we're going to talk about what is legalism. As you can see, all you have to do is YouTube what is legalism and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and pick from a plethora of videos of people describing legalism. And I'm just going to be one more video in that list giving you my impressions of what legalism really is. So let's get started. So in some ways, the Protestant evangelical world was a response to legalism in the, in the Middle Ages by the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, at that time, uh, when Martin Luther nailed his 95-point thesis to the, to, the, to the cathedral door in the German church, he was coming against the sacraments of buying salvation, things that we do outwardly that are supposedly going to grant us second grace or first grace or third grace or how we stay saved. And it was in that response that, that the Protestant Reformation was created to justify the belief that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. It is that period of time where we got terms such as sola scriptura, which is to put our faith in scripture alone. And it was out of this Reformation that we turned from the idea that we could have an outward form of godliness, deny the power of God thereof, as scripture says, and buy our way into salvation through works and through ritual practices of sacraments and ordinances. The man-made doctrines, as we see in Mark 7:7, 7, 7, where Jesus said, they worship me in vain by creating doctrines out of man-made ideas or commandments. Now, coming out of what I would call a severely legalistic church, and I always tend to mention the Oneness Pentecostal Church or the United Pentecostal Church that I came out of, they are certainly on the top of the echelon of legalistic churches, but they are not by any means the only church that practices legalism. I'm always amazed when I do these videos that there's somebody, some one person who will respond and say, well, you always pick on UPC. No, I pick on things that the UPC does. And if you open your mind up to the realm of the Christian world, you'll find out that the UPC does, is not the cornerstone of who does these things. It's what I experienced for 15 years. It's what opened my eyes to legalism and cult-style worship. And so I speak of it as my past experience, but I'm not saying they're the only ones who do this. I came from a Oneness Pentecostal church that was severely legalistic, even in the realm of the United Pentecostal Church. I've spoken with other UPC ministers about how our church operated, and they say, wow, that was a cult. So there are many, many different degrees of how these individual churches go about practicing legalism. And we're gonna define what legalism is very shortly, but I wanna illustrate this by giving you a short story. There was a young man who came to our church. This was years ago, probably four or five years ago. And he was a young Hispanic man, probably in, at 20, 21 years old, recently moved into our area. Somebody uh, found him, witnessed to him, brought him to the church. Eventually he sold out came in, found the truth, and became one of us. And how did he become one of us? Well, the idea in the legalistic system is that you repent, which actually means adopt the standards of the church. And that was no wearing of short sleeve shirts, no jewelry, guys had to have a certain kind of haircut. You wore the part, you acted the part, you played the part. He spoke in tongues, he ran around the aisles in worship, he jumped up and down. He did all the things that were expected of us, and that made him a brother. Now, legalism creates an outward expression, they say, of inward faith, and so long as the outward expression looks right, then we do not question the inward faith. It turned out that this young man, his face was suddenly on the local newspaper one day, and I saw it, I took a picture of it, I texted somebody in the church who knew him and I said, is this who I think it is? Turns out that this young man was a fugitive wanted in another state for molestation of a child. He had changed his name, ditched his car, 
collected new belongings, got under the table jobs, and he did everything he could to stay under the radar to escape that warrant for his arrest. Eventually, he was discovered through investigative process and bam, arrested one day, face on the paper. Everybody was shocked. Everybody was surprised. The reality was, in a legalistic system, and I'm not, I'm not blaming the, the Pentecostal church I was at for this scenario, but what I am saying is that in a legalistic scenario, so long as you look the part, you are the part. And nobody questions your background, your motives. We don't background check people. And the dangerous part about this scenario was he was immediately put on bus ministry, teaching in Sunday school classes. They surrounded this boy with children, unknowing that he was a fugitive for child molestation. And it was all based on the fact that he looked the part and he played the part. Legalism blinds the spiritual eyes of discernment and causes us to believe that so long as we put on the show, there's nothing to question. And that is dangerous. So what is legalism? I'm going to read this, what I wrote in an article, and I will post a link to my original blog article of what is legalism below in the description of this video. But this adequately defines in a paragraph what legalism is. And it's this. Legalism at its core is the belief that we can perform certain rituals and behave in certain fashions in order to please God and to warrant his favor. That man is so depraved that without certain hard lines being drawn in the sand that we must obey, of course administered by the local pastor, that we have no hope of obtaining the grace of Christ Jesus without performing said rituals. That's legalism. It is believing that we cannot attain God's grace unless we perform a certain way. We have to do certain things in order to get saved. And more importantly, as John Wesley announced in his second Works of Grace uh, movement, the Holiness Movement, that we have to continue to get saved or do particular things to stay saved. Now, we're not talking about sin. We're not saying that you could lose your salvation if you sin. This is saying in a legalistic system that you can lose your salvation if you just stop doing these man-made commandments. By way of example, and legalism can be taken to many extents, so please don't think this is a uh, once-all-tell-all list. But by way of example, in my old church, it was often taught that if you want God to bless you on your job, you'll be here every single time the door is open. God's not going to bless you if you're not at church every single time we have church. And of course, we had church three, four times a week. Nothing wrong with being there at church, but to teach people a performance-based idea that if you aren't there, God is going to curse you by way of lack of blessing. This is a legalistic system to get people in the pew. You want God to work in your marriage? Shave that beard. Be at prayer more than 30 minutes every single day. In my church, of course, facial hair was disallowed. And I can remember numerous people who were guests coming up to the altar to pray. And men would pray with them. Women would pray with them. But mostly, you know, I'm talking about men and facial hair. <laughs> Hopefully women don't have that problem. But they'd be praying with this guy. Arms up and all the hoopla, uh, the, the hokey pokies of, of Pentecostal churches. And at the end, the pastor would say, you know what, you so-and-so, I just believe that you could get the Holy Ghost and you just need to keep coming. And I'm telling you, you shave that beard and God will give you the Holy Ghost. A legalistic system, again, says you have to perform certain rituals and behave certain ways and look particular ways in order for God to grace your heart with his presence. Now, we know that God is not going to reside in sin. But when did facial hair become sin? This is the trap of legalism, that man gets to create new ideas of what sin is for you. I don't believe tithing is for New Testament Christians, believers. I believe giving, as the Pauline uh, grace-giving doctrine is formed in, in Corinthians. But tithing was an Old Testament taxation. It's not a New Testament requirement. If somebody wants to do it, that is their personal conviction. But to teach it as a must in order to gain God's grace and then you must continuously do this in order to stay saved is legalism. And I remember 
people saying things, not just in my church, other churches, not even non-Pentecostal churches. You can find this all across the board in the, in the evangelical world. Well, they'll say, if you don't pay your tithes, God's going to take that money from you. You're robbing God. He's going to rob you back. I had a brother-in-law whose car broke up, or broke down, transmission blew up, and the pastor from the pulpit said, if you'd have paid your tithes, your car would still be running today. If you're not going to pay it, God's going to take it. And that is a disgusting aspect of legalism. And of course, in the, in the apostolic Pentecostal religion I came from, it was all about dress. It was women don't cut your hair, men have short hair, no facial hair, nobody wears makeup, no jewelry, men don't wear shorts. We weren't allowed to wear short sleeve shirts. I know some Pentecostal churches allow that. Uh, but there was always this aspect of performing and looking the part in order to gain God's grace. And this always created an aura of fear fear that if we somehow weren't dressed correctly, God was going to be upset with us. Well, there was a trauma surrounding legalism, and this is why we can say legalism is idolatry. When playing the part and doing what the pastor tells you you must do becomes your focus that instead of am I pleasing God, Am I lining up to scripture? Am I obeying the gospel of Christ? Am I fulfilling the law of Christ, which was bearing one another's burdens? The Bible says that pure religion and undefiled before God is that you visit the widow and the fatherless in their time of distress. The Bible says also in Galatians that if somebody says, I'm cold and I'm hungry, and your response is, I'll pray for you, be ye fed and warm blessings and you do nothing to satisfy their immediate need, you are not fulfilling the gospel. That is the gospel. The gospel is not women never cutting their hair, women never wearing pants, always having the right clothes on, shaving your beard off, having your hair cut right, all these little particulars, they, they call them standards. Not bashing on those, but if, if that is our focus, if we believe that that is what makes us God's children, we have idolized legalism instead of revering God. And that is what legalism always and will always do, is create a system that traps you into obeying it instead of obeying Christ. Paul said it best when he wrote this in Corinthians 2 and 2, 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, For I made the decision to know nothing, that is, to forego philosophical and theological discussions regarding inconsequential things and opinions while among you accept Jesus Christ and him crucified and the meaning of his redemptive substitutionary death and his resurrection. Legalism is turning inconsequential things into doctrines of salvation and holiness just like the Roman Catholic Church did 500, 800, 1,000 years ago. If you want to get saved, you have to do this. And if you want to stay saved, you must continue to do this. Pray in tongues every day. Be at church every day. Be at outreach. Do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. And don't do this. And don't do that. The legalism is always about staying saved and idolizing a system to stay saved instead of putting all of your attention and focus and reverence upon Christ. In fact, this is why I personally, this is just Ralph, personally refuse to call pastors reverend, bishop, bishop, yeah, it's on the line. I mean, that's scriptural, but reverend and things like that. I am not revering a man, and I am not revering a system. I am going to revere the God who gave us the gospel of grace. That is the power of God unto salvation. It is important to know that Christ alone is what atones us and washes our sin away. It is the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us that makes us free from the guilt of sin. The Bible says that all the requirements of the law were nailed to the cross. And the Bible also says that by one man's disobedience, hearkening back to Adam, so by one man's obedience, Jesus Christ, are all made righteous and placed in right standing before God. Titus 3, 5 says that it is not by any works of righteousness that we can do. James rightly said that faith without works is dead. But he did not say 
works is faith. The works come because of your faith. Works don't save you and give you faith. I had a man the other day say that the grace of Ephesians, where it says, for you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. He said, you actually don't get that grace until you go do something, which is completely antithetical to the entire scripture. For you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. There's nothing you can do to merit atonement. So legalism says there's something you have to go do to gain atonement and to keep atonement. And the last point is, what are the fruits of the Spirit? If the fruit of the Spirit was that you would dress a certain way and perform a certain way, it would have been listed in Scripture. But Scripture says that the fruit of the Spirit, the the, the expression of your faith, that what's going to come out of you because of faith, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, which is self-control and self-discipline. That is the fruit of the Spirit. It is something churning and happening inside of you that causes you to portray the gospel and be the light unto the world. Legalism is a man-made system set up to control your behavior and tell you you must sit inside this box if you hope to gain God's attention and grace. The end of legalism is the beginning of a life of fulfillment in Christ above, which is purely and simply living the gospel message found in Galatians, that we're loving and caring for one another, fulfilling the law of Christ. And as Paul said, that is not an excuse for sin. God forbid. We're not talking about sin. We're talking about legalism that creates extra biblical rules to be saved and to stay saved. A church is not a legalistic church if they're preaching, you can't commit adultery. It's not a legalistic church to say, you got to believe in God. It's not a legalistic church to say, you've got to fulfill the gospel of grace and love one another. It is a legalistic church, and it is a legalistic system to say that unless you perform certain rituals and behaviors and dress standards and holiness standards, and you perform, 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 then you can't stay saved. That is legalism. So I hope that video helped clear up my perspective of what legalism is. I get a lot of flack sometimes, which is completely understandable, and I accept it, of picking on the UPC. Be frank, it's a cult. I believe that the United Pentecostal and the Oneness Pentecostal system is a cult. Are there good people in it? Yes. Are there good-natured, good-hearted, and good-intended and faith-filled people? Yes. I bet you there's those people in Mormonism too, in JW, in Scientology, and everything else that we would consider a cult. But it's a legalistic system, and I'm not picking on it alone. I will express the same level of dissatisfaction, and I will discern the things that are wrong with the other uh, movements and speak about them. But I have a 15-year history in the Oneness Pentecostal Church, which is why I talk about it. So I'm not just picking on one church. If you want to comment on my videos, I look forward to it. If this video was helpful to you, I hope you like and subscribe. Hit the bell button next to subscribe so you get notified when we make new videos. And once again, please uh, check out our podcast called Spiritual Recovery by Ralph Brickley. It is on the Google Store. It's on iTunes. And you can also help support that channel at patreon.com forward slash spiritual recovery. God bless. Hope this video helped. Look forward to hearing from you in the comments below.